Hi, everybody, and welcome to our live show discussion of The Boy Who Lost Fairyland by Catherine M. Valenti. This is the fourth book in the Fairyland series. We have been reading through the series, dedicating a live show to every book. Um, and of course, I am joined by Kara. This is her project. I'm the guest. <laughs> but this month or this book, we are on my channel uh, doing this. But I'll let Kara introduce herself and then say a little bit about um, a little something about this project and what her intention was with it. So we'll start there. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Kara. My channel is Wild Book Garden. Um, and as Mari said, this is my project, but she's kind of our resident fairyland expert. So <laughs> I feel like she's also in charge of part of it. But um, this is kind of the kickoff to a like larger reading project and book club I had an idea for that I've been thinking about for a while um, called the Not A Genre Book Club. And that's where we basically read middle grade and young adult books and we discuss them with the same kind of depth and care and attention to detail that maybe not everyone is used to doing. Um, like I think that's something that's a lot more common with classic novels or like adult fantasy or something, um, which is not to say that people never think of those things with kid lit, but I think it's less common. Um, and the Fairyland series is one I had never read, but it seemed like a prime candidate to kind of kick this off because I knew there was, like from other things I've read from Catherine and Valenti, I knew there would be a lot of really complex characters, really deep themes and lots to dig into. So this is our fourth book of our like first series read along and it's been great. I can't, I'm like so excited. I'm finally reading the series. I know. I'm so excited too. It's really funny. This is so such a like random segue. Uh, we will be talking about this book, but um, on TikTok, like there was another like round of discourse going ar around today and it was basically somebody in response to somebody like ranking Stephen King books like did a response it was like uh basically saying that like crapping on fantasy in general and saying that it's not literature and you know like you know when you read literature you understand that like fantasy is like basically he said like a gateway drug into reading and like <laughs> literature is sort of where you end up at um you know, you know which <laughs> is just uh, so condescending and whatever but just like wrong on every level because like <laughs> The classification of like literature has nothing to do with genre at all, uh, yeah. first of all. But, you know, that is definitely the sentiment. And I was thinking about it because we're sitting here talking about this like middle grade book. Uh, we're, we're kind of bordering this fourth book. It's still pretty middle grade because of the main character. But our main main character is now 15. So we're like, you know, yeah. aging up with her or whatnot. But we're, we're talking about these kids books. These are fantasy books. But there is so much here to just like dig into and it is so beautifully written and it's so thoughtful yeah. uh so just thinking about that and and in terms of like how people can often look down on genre yeah. fiction on fiction that is not for adults right uh is, yes. is uh, pretty upsetting but <laughs> we know yeah, that <laughs> right and that's that's kind of one of the things that made me finally like okay I actually need to organize this because like I have just been seething about this for years and I'm like okay well at least do something productive with it don't just like occasionally mention in a video how bitter you are about it it's like let's and, and I think also I hope that there are people out there who like they want some place to start you know like they're yeah. maybe they're not used to thinking of kids books or especially maybe kids fantasy in this way and they're open to that and they just kind of need a direction um so hopefully yeah hopefully these discussions can maybe help do that but yeah that's it's so frustrating especially because and this is not to say that like fantasy is always better than other genres although i love fantasy but i feel like with genre fiction and speculative genres in particular you can actually do more with them mm -hmm. in some ways because of the freedom that that gives you in terms of like creating worlds and in situations and just like I don't know I think some of the best themes and commentary that I've ever seen has often been in fantasy so it's like he's he's missing out on a lot of literature yeah, literature <laughs> literature <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, so we have made it to the fourth book in the Fairyland series. I am like dying to know. I'm going to just throw this first question out there for you. Did you like this book? 
I loved it. Like I finished it. I finished it and I'm like, okay, this is like a close second for my favorite in the series. Oh, like wow. maybe, maybe like tied. And like at this point, I've just been like sitting and marinating in my emotions. And I'm like, I think it's tied for my favorite. <laughs> yeah. It's really I interesting to me because I I consider this one my least favorite in the series. Um, and that has been like confirmed for me in previous rereads, but in this reread, I appreciated it a lot more. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say it's like as high up as the second, but I think maybe um, the girl who soared over the moon might be the weaker, weakest one in, in the series. And this one might bump it up a little bit, but I've always considered this one, one of the weaker, we this is all relative because all of these books are like, four stars and above for me. <laughs> but So I was like really curious how you would find it and to hear that you loved it. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, kind of similarly to the second one, there's just a lot of things about this one specifically where I'm like, Catherine, did you write this for me? <laughs> like, <thank you. laughs> uh, This one is awesome. I, okay, the thing that I find really interesting about this book like in the series is that we've spent the first three books with September as our main character. We leave the third book off on sort of a, a cliffhanger of sorts. And then you start the fourth book and we're meeting this entirely new cast of characters. Um, how did you feel about like that departure from the main story and sort of the placement of this book? You don't know the end yet, but so far yeah, the yeah. Of this book in the series. I think I had the benefit of knowing that that's what this book was. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably if I hadn't known that and we have the cliffhanger of the third book and then we start the fourth one and I'm like, where is everybody? <laughs> like, I think maybe I would have been maybe a little more frustrated, but I kind of knew what this one was going to be. And I also knew that there was a very good chance that I would love this main character because I think I mentioned in our last live show that um, very specific thing I love is stories where you follow, it's like a changeling story, but you follow the fairy child mm. um, instead of the human. Like, I just love that. There is something about that that just gets me in my feelings every time. And so I knew that that was going to be the protagonist of this book. So I like went into this one, like feelings ready. <laughs> like um, I think like in terms of what I've read of the series overall, I think it doesn't feel... I mean, it is the only one so far that we have just a completely new main character, but it actually feels less disconnected to me than like the third book, for example, because mm -hmm. that one, we have all that set up before September even gets back to Fairyland. And then when we get there, she's not with the gang <laughs> for like half the book, <laughs> uh, which I personally found much more upsetting than this one, because I knew we'd eventually get back to September. And mm -hmm. I loved Hawthorne and Tamburlaine so much that I'm like, I also really care about you guys, <laughs> like even though you're new. So yeah. I love in general, just like in the structure of series, when there is something that sort of interrupts the flow or that resets a series uh, or things like that. So I just love that we like, and, and it is so satisfying from that perspective of thinking about like, okay, if September's over there, like who's over here and the give and take of it all. So I thought that that was really satisfying. And I loved that she kind of played with this like separate story and, even even in it, I think it feels like super connected to the series as a whole, because even in previous books, we've had sort of interludes that felt similar, whether it was the key on the journey to find September or the crows that sneak into fairyland and like kind of go on their own. So she's been doing this thing where she kind of takes us off in different directions. And this felt like that, but on a larger scale. So it still okay. felt very like fairyland to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, this definitely felt like in line with the way she tells stories where mm -hmm. she'll like, I'm going to take you over here for a minute and you won't know what this has to do with anything and you'll love it by the end. <laughs> <laughs> trust me, trust me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned too, like, you know, the the fact that like we've grown to love our main set of characters and we come here and we're like, oh, where are they? But then for me, at least very quickly, I was like won over by our new cast of characters. So let's start with Hawthorne slash Thomas. Uh, yeah. How did you feel about him? Tell me all of your feelings about <sighs> Hawthorne. 
I love my sweet troll son. Like, I just, <laughs> um, I, I felt for him so much. I also just, I pretty much loved him immediately. Um, I felt for him because, like, very, very similarly to September, um, he, like, kind of makes a choice, but not really. I mean, I think he has less say over it than September did. And he just gets thrown into a world he doesn't understand, a world that he doesn't feel like he fits into. Like he has this like sense that something's wrong and that he doesn't belong here, but he doesn't know what that is. So he just is like left feeling like he might be the problem. And I'm like, no, Hawthorne. <laughs> like, I just I just wanted to like give him a hug. Um and I also I really loved too that even though I feel like a lot of the a lot of this book deals with like loneliness and kind of like feeling disconnected from the world or from other people. Um, but then how friendship can kind of pull you out of that. But even before Hawthorne like makes friends with Tamburlaine, who I also loved, um, one of the things that I just really love about him is that even though he is he has all of this like heartache, you know, like he he has this constant feeling of like why do I feel wrong? What's going on? It's like, he's such a kind person. Like he's still like, he doesn't turn that on other people, like against mm -hmm. other people. And I just, I just, yeah, I loved him. I think this is going to be like all of our other discussions where I just kind of trail off and I'm like, I love them. 10 out of 10. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard to discuss Thomas without like linking it to some of like the thematic stuff that you yeah. already brought up. Um, I think it is so smart to like explore themes of loneliness and belonging and um, sort of being, you know, the the outsider in a story of a chain of the fairy child in the human world and yeah. putting that focus around it. I thought I, I will say I say that this is like my least favorite book in the series. And most of that has to do with like pacing and, and the way that this felt like two stories sort of like shoved together. Mm -hmm. And I needed like 25, 30 more pages to really like kind of, you know, fluff it out. But the first half of this book, I think is exquisite. I freaking loved and from the moment that we meet him and he's being whisked away to like when he's writing his rules in the notebook, all of that. I just think the like the words, the, the selection of feelings, the way that she describes things like there are like, I don't know, so many wonderful, beautiful moments that just take us through this like whirlwind of his childhood, but that capture all of these feelings of like trying to figure out your place in 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 life. So, so, so wonderfully and so beautifully. Uh, so, yes, I love him, too. I love how he navigates like being alone and different and whatnot and I love how even when he's like I gotta do the normal thing uh he's doing it in the wildest weirdest way possible yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's so true to himself even when he's not even trying to be like so that was adorable I think it's just really difficult to read this and like not root for Hawthorne yeah yeah he's he's very earnest and genuine and mm -hmm. Yeah, he just, he like lives with his whole heart <laughs> and, and it gets him hurt sometimes, but I love him anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Elisa is talking about figuring out she was autistic and reading this book around that time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. All of everything that it had to do with like the rules. It also gave me like a lot of feelings about like the sort of things that we prize in children, like the sort of behaviors that we prize mm -hmm. in children. Um, especially when you consider like you compare that to um, the sort of characteristics that we prize in fictional children like our heroes right we want them to be loud and brave and like you know all of these really big emotional sort of things um but when we think about what we consider like a well-behaved child a well-adjusted yeah. it is all of these like smaller things it's you know like I, you know it's it's not so much of those like big uh, showy emotions sort of things one of the my favorite moments early on is when he gets his report card and the teacher is like your kid is too smart 
and I don't like it. And I'm like, <laughs> isn't isn't that just the way? Yeah. Isn't that just how we treat children sometimes? And like the things that we prize in a child is for them to be quiet and to be, you know, like in their place and and to do things yeah. just so and listen to what I'm telling you and don't worry about it, just kind of do it. Uh, and so that, that gave me all kinds of feelings. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like one of the other like benefits of having Hawthorne as I mean, he, he doesn't know he's an outsider exactly, but kind of giving us that perspective is like, it really highlights how absurd a lot of our like social norms are. And like, not, not all of them, not in terms of like, you know, being polite or friendly to people or anything, but like, yeah, his notebook with the rules and how, like, when you hear somebody describe it, it's like, yeah, that's bonkers. And we all just agree to go along with it. <laughs> like, I think that's things like, uh, you know, spinach is poison and I can't figure out why adults are feeding us poison. Uh, and we like, <laughs> know vegetables are good for you. But when you think from a child's perspective of like, yes. this is disgusting. Why are you feeding me this? But it's just like, a thing we do you know so like yeah. even little moments like that I was like yeah you're right like yeah. I don't know <laughs> or when he's in school and he's like talking about like the bell ringing and it's like the teacher is like the wicked like magician who keeps us spellbound but she can be defeated by the sound of a bell being <laughs> rung like <laughs> it's like so charming and funny but it's like also really brilliant yes like, it's true <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, all right. I I, I want to come back to Thomas and talk a little about him and his parents a little bit. But before we get there, I think that we should talk some more about like the main characters that were introduced here. So we talked about Tom. So no, now Tam. Uh, <laughs> how did you feel about Tam? <laughs> I unsurprisingly, I loved her as well. Um, one thing that I was like consistently impressed with as we were following her is that this is going to sound weird there are some authors who like when they write like a certain kind of very like whimsical middle grade like fantasy kind of story the main characters or like or the the main like female characters can feel like a middle grade version of a manic pixie dream girl mm -hmm. <laughs> like I don't know how else to explain it there's like this very mm -hmm. specific character type that that it reminds me of and Tamberlane is not like that at all even though like she has some of those like characteristics that you might think would be kind of I don't know almost like generic quirkiness but she's not and I think again it comes back to like this whole series being so genuine in the way that it's written and these characters being so genuine um and I love the fact that Tamberlane and September I feel like are they would get along, you know, they'd be really good friends, but they still feel like distinct people. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I just really loved Tamberlane and Hawthorne's friendship so much. Like it just, it makes me so happy that these two misfits found each other. Um, yeah, just yeah. again, Tamberlane, 10 out of 10. <laughs> like, <laughs> I also really love that um, they're both of their magic like hers is like with like art and, and paint mm -hmm. with words and writing and like what that puts at the forefront of like loving both of those things and like appreciation of, of like the message of like art is magic uh, you know at the heart of that I thought was so lovely as well there I, I don't know why a number of scenes from this book that like that are just like super vivid in my mind have to do with Tam I don't know why the scene where she breaks her leg and he and, yeah. and he rushes over and she's like please 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 say everything's okay and and what <laughs> that lives in my memory so strong the the baseball jumping out of his pocket and then being like hmm, job well done yeah. <laughs> Yeah. memory um and also the one you know when they have the party when they find out like when she's teaching him like you have magic too and they just make all of these things come alive I think that that's a really neat scene as well so a lot yeah. of things from this book that stick out to me are related to Tam so I love her a lot too yeah all right you know who's coming next if you did not love this character I would be absolutely surprised <laughs> but 
or combat wombat. <laughs> I, I will lay down my life for Blunderbuss. Like, <laughs> I, I freaking loved her. Like, I think at least like four or five of my quotes are like things that Blunderbuss <laughs> says. Like, I just, oh my God. Yeah. I, I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> like, I, she's one of those characters that I love out of all proportion mm -hmm. to her page time. Yeah. Because she's like so vivid, even though she's only in kind of the last chunk of the book. Um, I think it also helps that she reminds me actually of one of my cats. <laughs> like yeah. that part where she's, yeah, that part where she's talking about like, we bite to show we like things and then we don't like things. And when we're hungry and when we're curious, it's like that. That's my cat, Nala. I was just going to say, this is the first time I've read the, reread this book while having my puppy, my new dog. Uh, and and he is a combat wombat apparently because he bites because he loves me. He nibbles when he doesn't like me. Like I was reading that part and I'm like, oh my God, it's a puppy. Um, but I guess a cat as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just love Blunderbuss and how she's like such a quintessential like tough love kind of character like and she looks so cuddly you know like you picture this like little wombat made out of yarn it's like oh and it's like mm -hmm. she'd tear your face off mm -hmm. but only if you're hurting someone she cares about like <laughs> I, I also <sighs> love her. just um the way that like I don't know a lot of the way that she expresses herself it's like a lot of yelling and a lot of like big emotions and stuff and just like very aggressive whether it's positive or negative and it's just always hilarious to me <laughs> yes yes um, we also have uh scratch scratch is the name of the yeah. That like uh, it so there were so many like I don't know it was really funny because we were putting together we put together basically like this like found family and like part two of very distinct characters but they also had like a lot of things that like reminded me of our like our OG characters so like yeah. A through L and Blunderbuss are super super different right in, in character but I don't know they. It reminded every time I was with a blender bus, I was like, oh, my wife are right. like, <laughs> and uh, Scratch, it was, the, it really reminded me of, um, oh, gosh, the, the lantern. Gleam. Yeah. Gleam, yeah. I was so, thinking that too. So yeah. there were moments, even when we were like with our new friends, there were moments that I was like, oh, our old friends. So it was like really <laughs> a nice yeah. comparison. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's there's like moments where I'm just sitting here like, and I'm emotional about an a sentient gramophone. Okay, like, <laughs> which I love. I love that I'm emotional about a sentient gramophone. But um, yeah, it's it's like so amazing to me that that like characters that have no lines like this, and they barely like so much of their characterization is very understated, mm -hmm. and it's still. Like, they still feel like their own characters. Yeah. And just, I love them. Yeah. All right. I wanted to circle back around to um, Hawthorne and Tom, Thomas's parents in the human world or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, because he obviously has, like, a struggle uh, because he feels like he doesn't belong to this family. And we see that his father is the one that is always like, be normal. And, but his mother is trying. I had so many freaking emotions about this yeah. mother trying <laughs> and like telling his her little troll boy that she doesn't know is a troll about like magic and trying to like, I don't know, relate to him and like trying to like smooth things out between the father and the son. And this isn't a big part of the book, I don't feel like, but I just had any time that this was happening, I just had so many emotions over this. I don't know, this is like, you know, when a, a very adult reading kid lit sort of thing where I'm like honing in on the parents like <laughs> <laughs> look at look at how much care she's taking with her child yeah um I I also loved Gwendolyn like she has her own separate bullet point on my list because like <laughs> I just yeah I exactly like you said she doesn't have that many scenes but I love all the ones that she has like she she really is trying and she's so 
like you you can tell that she like doesn't understand her son but she loves him so much anyway and she's mm -hmm. like i don't have to get you i just have to love you and take care of you and like do my best to understand you and i just like i really love that and i think that's one of the things that i love about changeling stories or that i i think is a more interesting path to take because like if his life in the human world was like always awful i feel like there wouldn't be as many there wouldn't be like the high stakes of like what is he gonna do you know because he wants to get back to fairyland he has his family but like this in this world he also has people who care about him like his mom specifically and i just think that makes this story just so much more meaningful and emotional um like i, I feel like she's an example of one of the things I love about Valenti's characters is that she doesn't take the easy way out. Um, like she doesn't, she doesn't take shortcuts, you know, cause she could have made like both of the parents just the enemy or like the antagonists. And she doesn't she, like Gwendolyn is like a really good mom. and She's like doing her best, even though she doesn't understand her child at all. And yeah, I, I had a lot of feelings about her as well. I loved her. Um, yeah. <laughs> I also, to that end of like not taking the easy way out and sort of making things complicated and complex, I think it would be easy to also like veer off into this thing of like, well, the humans are the bad guys or the human world is like so stupid and like with no shades of complexity or like the human, our, our rules and our ways is like the ridiculous thing. But the truth of the matter is that like there are ridiculous things here. There are ridiculous things in fairyland. There are good fairies and good people and bad fairies and bad people. And so like she gives us, she runs the gamut, right? So we have the dad that doesn't get it and the mom who she's got the spirit, right? She's trying. Um, <laughs> so I, I appreciated that as well. And there, there were so many um, callbacks to like previous entries in, in the series. Um, little things like on the first day of school they only learn the alphabet a through l <laughs> to the yes! letter l um <laughs> i don't know just like so many and he mentions like a wyvern like oh this like a wyvern's nest or whatever but every time it was a callback to anything else in the series i was like yay <laughs> yes. it felt so special <laughs> yeah Yep, I like those little moments. <laughs> All right. Um, so anything else? Uh well, okay. I was gonna like move on, but um, so that's the the first half of this book. We're like meeting this new cast of characters. They get pulled into Fairyland. Um, and then we they get put on this quest, right? And then that's what puts them into the path of meeting September once again. So how did you feel about like when we finally got there, seeing September again, and overall, like the plot of this book and how it progressed the series? Yeah, um, I I was very happy when they had their little like meeting slash reunion for us. Um, as I was saying earlier, I don't think I don't think it felt as drawn out to me as like the reunion of the previous book. Um, partly because like I just I really loved. Hawthorne and Tamberlane, and I was invested in them enough that I was like, okay, I can wait to hear about September. That's all right. Um, in terms of the plot, I feel like the part, the only part where it felt a little bit like, okay, I'm ready. Like, what's happening next is like right after they get to Fairyland, but before mm -hmm. they really have kind of figured out what they're doing or what the quest is, because mm -hmm. all of the setup was so good. And like, mm -hmm. I again, I just like love hanging out with these characters. And then like the part at the end is great too. And so there's just that little bit in the middle where it's just kind of, they're like wandering around and eating fruit. And I'm like, okay. Like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that is probably why this like, this like takes a dip in my estimation. I think the, the third and the fourth ones, none of these books are particularly plot heavy, right? Yeah. There's a lot of like vibes and like, I don't know weird things like <laughs> and I love that but I think the third and fourth books are the ones that lose the threat of the threat of the plot the most um the the third book 
don't ask me to explain what happened in that book. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> the fourth book is a little more logical, but I think it just kind of loses it in that moment when we do get to fairyland and they're just like, doop, 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 fruits. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it maybe stands out to me a little more because the books are so short, you know, yes. that like if this were like a, you know, 350 or 400 page fantasy book, it's like, all right, we spend like, 15 pages eating fruit that's okay but <laughs> because it is a relatively high percentage of the book it's like guys like what are you doing um which like I, to be clear I really I think she does an amazing job with like a series of very short novels like I'm so impressed at how complete they all feel but that's one of the only things where I'm like okay this doesn't feel like it fits with the overall like structure of the book like this is a lot of just hanging out when mm -hmm. there's like that baseball monster that's like running around and they're like <laughs> i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i will say that for a series of books that is not super plot heavy right that it is more about the characters and the settings or whatever i find like the domino effect of everything that does happen so satisfying um and that carries from book to book right from september coming to fairyland and then like cutting off her shadow and having to deal with the shadow in the second book and you know all everything that like you know the fairies coming back and she gets rid of the the mark marquess so you know now charlie Con crunch chab is king Con crunch his name is so hard to say. <laughs> His king. Um, and I just love sort of the the way that um, September getting to Fairyland and it being like, okay, this is your mission. You need to get rid of the sitting queen, right? And then Hawthorne getting to Fairyland and meeting the king who's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those two things I think are really wonderful. I also love that whole sequence where they're just like, so stop being king. And he's like, whoa, I should have thought of that. <laughs> it's like, thank God we've got you guys here to fix everything. Yeah. Um, I also, I love how the the whole like Charlie Crunch Crab thing fits into like some of the other stuff that's been happening, like with like you were saying, like September kind of like starting a revolution and then like, yes. oh, wait, we actually do need some form of like organization here. I, <laughs> yes, I feel like one of the recurring themes is like this job sucks. Nobody wants it. Yes. Like, yes. Or I guess like if they do want it, then usually they end up being like the Marquess where they like start out with good intentions and then everything goes wrong. But I just find it really funny how like every time september or like one of the other main characters they're like okay we fixed it like for good now everything's fine and then they come back and like the new person is like absolutely not get me out of here <laughs> i i love that one of the things especially uh, if you are i think an adult reading the series like one of the things that i think um not that kids can't enjoy it because I think that they will enjoy it in sort of their own way. But the thing, a thing that you like get a lot more of as an adult is the way that you know, Valenti explores sort of the absurdity of bureaucracy in like all forms. Like I, I think Kat Valenti is obsessed with like a liminal space. She's obsessed with like bureaucracy because the way yeah. that she talks about these things, like from, you know, every time we go through customs or every time we travel the post office, like the, everybody who sits as a, a, like in government, basically at Fairyland being like, this is the worst. There's even a, a quote in this that is like, uh, you know, don't worry about the rules. And if you break some laws, don't worry. They might give you a parade and make you like uh, a leader or something, you know, it's something along those lines. Like, yeah. don't worry about it. If you break the rules, you, you they might elect you to government anyways, kind of thing. And I'm just like, yeah. the political commentary, top notch. <laughs> it's just like a fine wine. Like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yes, but I yeah. love it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's so smart. And it's like you said, I think kids are still going to get enjoyment out of those parts. But I think you're going to have different kinds of enjoyment depending on where you're at in your life. <laughs> um, I remember one of our previous discussions, you like summed it up as like government's going to government. And I'm like, that is exactly <laughs> like for September every single time. It's like she comes up against like, oh, wait, like there's still people in charge. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, any thematic things that we haven't touched on yet that you'd like to talk about? 
Let me look at my super professional list that I scribbled on an envelope here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I think we talked about a lot of these ones. I mean, as as with all the books, just like I get so in my feelings about the growing up thing. And I mm-hmm. think that's one of the things that like makes it so hard to recommend this series because it's like there's a very particular kind of like emotion it has about growing up. And I'm like, I, I feel like if I were to recommend it to someone, I'd be like, okay, if you don't feel like a little bit sad about like growing up and not being a kid anymore, you probably won't vibe with it just because there's that like, there's that kernel of bittersweetness that yes. I love. Yes. Um, oh, I also, I really loved um, the way that you can kind of look at Hawthorne's story and like his, you know, the way he grew up, just like feeling like, you know, lost and like out of place and not knowing why. That's what kills me is that like, it's it's not like he even just spends the whole time missing fairyland until he can get back. It's like, he doesn't know why he feels that way. And that just breaks my heart. Um, but I love that, like his story, you can also kind of view it as like, the idea of like you belong somewhere you know Mm -hmm. and it's like there is a place that is like perfectly for you and like people who care about you and also how he has some of those people in the human world too you know like I mean Tamberlane is also a changeling but like his mom Gwendolyn (laughs) who we love Mm -hmm. um yeah I just I think it's really beautiful the way this book plays with family and found family and I like the end of the book with like I mean, man, Catherine Valenti, she can hit an ending. She can really <laughs> hit an ending. Yeah. Um, just, uh, yeah. I Sorry, I'm like so incoherent about this. I'm just like <laughs> no, you're walk, walking you through all of my emotions as I experience them. But um, yeah, that was one of my other kind of favorite thematic things of this book is like belonging and how um, she is kind of saying like there is a place for you there are people for you but that also doesn't mean that you can't find people elsewhere too like I just love that you can belong in more than one place it's just beautiful I think there's also like a a a, like thinking about like you know somebody reading this who maybe feels like um out of place in their family or, or or whatnot having that hope of like well you will eventually find people who understand you in a place where you will belong and like that hopefulness i think is really really sweet um yeah. and then, Shelley yeah. Bean also said sorry just like i saw they said hawthorne actually being popular in school yeah. i love that that is like one of my favorite examples of how like Catherine Valenti plays with expectations in ways that like a lot of other fantasy stories don't because like when we get to that point I'm like oh no is this gonna be a bullying book like I I don't like those that's not gonna be fun and it's like no kids love him (laughs) so anyway I'm sorry to interrupt I just saw that comment and I got excited that was good uh yes I you also mentioned like aging and like growing up being like a perpetual theme in, in the series as a whole. I love when we get to the end and like um September is like the spinster or whatnot. Um, but she's got like a couple of these thoughts and lines the narrator does too about like, you know, that's how growing up is, is that like one moment you're whatever age and then the next you look up and you're in your head, you're still one age, but like, <laughs> your, your body didn't get the memo. <laughs> <laughs> and I hard like in my head I'm still in my mid 20s you know and I'm mm-hmm. like staring down the barrel of 37 so uh yes hard relate to like that that like perception of the passage of time but being Kat Valenti she makes it right like fantasy right this yeah 15 year old stuck in the spinster's body or whatnot so <laughs> <laughs> I love that um and then the other thing that uh, yes, the September is a glorious spinster. Gave me very much um, uh, House Moving Castle vibes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the other thing that I really enjoyed about this thematically, uh, Valenti does not um, shy away from sort of like putting the darker aspects of fairy tale like at the forefront and this is still full of whimsy and I don't think it's like necessarily just a dark story like there is a lot of like positive messages and themes and hopefulness and what or whatnot but um there's there's like a 
like I don't know a coming face to face with some of the like tropes of fairy tales and being like th this is messed up and I think wow. everything to do with the changeling yes. like was absolutely presented in this way especially at the very beginning when we see um the red wind like literally just carting him off and this like small child being like where am I going like the wow. even though it's presented with all of this whimsy like I was reading it and like so deeply uncomfortable with the way that it was happening. You could tell that it's like super dark, like everything about this child, like feeling out of place because he was whisked away. And then she constantly reminds us that this is happening to balance the scales so that this sort of like story and magic maintains in the human world. Like this is the price we pay to have that like preserved here. But the price is like actual children and when you consider the other end of that and everything September has suffered uh to like be the other end of that I think you know that is and the thing is that it's not only suffering right she's got her friends and she wants to go back and she loves fairyland and there's all of these really wonderful things about it but that doesn't divorce sort of like the darkness of it all um yeah. and and like the that that portion of it because I love fairy tales to actually have somebody like looking at it and be like this is kind of dark I love that yeah I love that so <laughs> yeah like this is messed up actually <laughs> yes um, yeah I I love that too and I feel like that goes back to one of the other things we keep discussing is like consequences and how these books like are really like focused on it or like they don't shy away it's like there are like your choices have an impact and often it's on other people you know it's not like yeah September does suffer but she's not always the she's not always the one who does and like poor Hawthorne like had very little choice like he's like this tiny child who is not really capable of like fully understanding what's what's being asked of him or what's like I don't even remember if the Red Wind even asked him or if it was kind of just like all right like you're you're the tax for today um and I really appreciate how Valenti writes all of this in a way that like even when like the Red Wind for example or other characters are being um, like kind of like blasé about it it's like we're not supposed to feel that way like the way she's writing it and the way that like Hawthorne and the other children are experiencing it it's like we are clearly being shown how awful and messed up this is even when the people doing it don't care mm -hmm. and I think that's like a real skill that I think not all fantasy writers can do um I yeah I think it's something that a lot of writers maybe think they can but I think there is like this is a great example of how you can write commentary even when the characters doing the bad things don't think it's bad yes. um and I really like that yeah the last thing that I kind of wanted to bring up in, in terms of like, I, I don't know that this is like super thematic. Maybe it's like half theme, half character. Um, but, <laughs> so very appropriate for these books. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I continue to be so, so, so in love with the narrator and the role of the narrator in these books and like that relationship that we've developed with the narrator. Um, and I think that that was like, probably more um, sort of at the forefront in this book because we took this like like little diversion from our main storyline. So there were a number of times where like she was addressing us, the narrator was addressing us as they often do. And they're like, I bet you're wondering about our friends and like, yeah. <laughs> or like, trust me, I'm getting there. And like yeah. those little like interactions just made me really appreciate the narrator's role and voice in all of this. And I loved that. Okay, so my question, I don't know that I, I have never read the prequel novella that, that is like attached to this. So that is one thing. Second, I don't know that I've ever really noticed this or thought this, but we take a chapter break to go visit um, or like a little interlude to go see September's parents. We learn their names for the first time. Uh, and, you know, September's mom is crying because September is missing and her aunt Margaret is there like comforting her. Uh, aunt Margaret visited Fairyland and that is the yeah. like old prequel story or whatnot. But there is a line that says that like September's mom is asking, is she OK or like, will she be back? Where is she sort of thing? And Aunt Margaret doesn't say anything. And then the next line says 
as a narrator, it's tough. Like we can't always say what we want to say. Uh, we have to hold some things back. And I was like, does this mean that Aunt Margaret is the narrator? Is that what that is? Because it's like Aunt Margaret doesn't say anything. And then the next line is like, as narrator, sometimes we can't always say what we want to say. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Are you? I didn't think of that. Is that what it is? Or is it is that what it wants you to think? It's like, I don't know. I just was like, hmm. Yeah. Something. <laughs> Very intriguing possibility. Yes. Uh, but I did love that moment of going to see and like seeing, you know, her mom, like, where's my daughter? Um, another yeah. one of those things uh, where like we are seeing the actual consequence of like, you yes. know, the, yeah. the other end of it, you know, September's off having her adventure and her parents are like, where did she go? So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I really feel like, and I kind of was talking about this earlier with, um, Hawthorne story but with September's as well is like for me for like a portal fantasy to really fully work I have to not know what I want to happen you know like and I think these books do that so well um because even when I'm like rooting for September to get back to fairyland sooner it's like when when she doesn't come back this last time you know and we see we see her parents it's it's hard and it feels like again there is a cost there is a consequence to these things and it's still a really like fun and fantastical and whimsical story but then there's all those like underlying ideas of like what are these choices going to mean it's like yeah I just I love not knowing what I want to happen <laughs> in stories like this like there's no there's no good answer the next book answers the narrated question. I've read the next book, but I don't remember this at all. The next book is the one that I've re read the least number of times. I think I've read it two times uh, and, and separated by a number of years. So I don't remember this portion at all. I'm very curious <laughs> now <laughs> and figure it out. Especially because like, that was the first time I had even noticed that line. And I was like, hmm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay. Anything else? Anything on your list that we didn't get to? Any bullet points? Or can we jump into a uh, quote corner? I know. <laughs> like, I, buckle up, everyone. I've got a lot for this one. <laughs> um, I think the only other thing that we didn't like specifically touch on is that I really, really liked that we actually get to meet Thomas. Like the yeah, the human, yeah. the human yeah. child. Like I love that he was kind of in the group, and I love like his ending and like. Ugh, yeah, just even even this that part of the ending feels bittersweet to me because even though like the kids are back with their families, which is obviously really good and important, there's like this part of me that's like, but like Hawthorne's or his human mother <laughs> is never going to know that I don't know. Like this is weird, but it's like she's never gonna know that she like loved both of her sons, you know? Yes. Like it just yes. <sighs> It just gets me in my feelings it but it's it feels like a perfect ending because it's like yeah this would be like who gets the kids like it's yeah yeah i that also got me to um you think like down the line especially because you, you end up with the son that's gonna like fit in more if yeah. there will ever be a moment where she looks back and is like well, what happened to you know like, <laughs> when she when she goes to check on him at night like before she goes to bed and it's like oh he's like dressed as Robin Hood for some reason like what's going on? <laughs> and like so we're we're seeing the chapter from her perspective and he just goes like hi mom and I'm like, oh, like almost crying just like <laughs> I love it <laughs> me too <laughs> all right Hit me with your best quotes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I actually, I prepared and I wrote down the page numbers instead of having to just scroll through my phone and find like very blurry photographs of them. So we'll see if this, if this goes any smoother. Um, but let's see my, oh, the first one I have. Any city looks a bit like its mother and father. If you peer closely at New York, you will see that the old girl has Dutch ears and English eyes. London cannot hide her Roman nose, and Rome has a way of laughing that is awfully Greek. This is why you may see streets in one city with just the same name as the streets in another, and even cities with identical names, like two Joshuas or Amys in the same class. To be a city is to belong to a family, each taking after another, 
remembering fondly their old grandfathers and great aunts, all the way back to the very first hut and fire and lonely cave with horses painted on it that had no name at all. In one city, if you are very clever and sneaky, you can spy out the whole world it belongs to, just as you can spy out a few thousand years of singing and dancing and making bread and putting babies to bed in any single person's face. Love it. <laughs> Love it. It's like it starts off like really whimsical and fun. And then by the end, I'm like, wow, I'm emotional about just like history existing. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's mine. One of mine. The heart is a tidiness engine when it comes to the task of knowing and unknowing. And it tends to clear out anything that doesn't fit fit with what they read in respectable newspapers and heard from people wearing glasses come springtime. <laughs> Beautiful. Yep. Um, let's see. Oh, th I think this is a shorter one if I can find. Why did I write this page down? Hold on. Sorry. Uh... Oh, <laughs> this is with the postmaster. Sure, if you want your pretty English sword to end up stuck in a stump in a Louisiana swamp, and the poor croc who signed for it, wondering what to do with the enclosed glittering Samite gown and Welsh dictionary. <laughs> I love the whole post office bit. <laughs> yep. Yep. One can only know the weight and heft of the prices one pays oneself. The costs borne by others are their own, secret, deep, and long. Beautiful. Yep. This is on page nine, right from the get-go. Uh, little baby Hawthorne is like, what's a human? Is it like a toad? Can I ride one? The red wind pondered. A human is a know-it-all ape who got so good at magic, it thought there was nothing special about the way it behaved, and then forgot magic ever existed in the first place. You should most definitely try to saddle one up. I also have that on island. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, here's an earlier one. This is also chapter one. That might hurt my feelings if we went on holiday together every year and belonged to the same blustering society, but we have only just met. One cannot really be bothered by insults from strangers. <laughs> do you remember being born only a few can say they do and not be caught immediately in the lie and most of them are wizards i of course remember it perfectly certain benefits are granted to narrators as part of the hiring package to compensate for our irregular hours and unsafe working conditions as clear as waking i remember your hands on the cover of the book your bright eyes moving swiftly over the pages the light of your reading lamp your small laughs and occasional puzzlements but it is against the rules for a human to recall the moment of their birth. If people did remember it, they would never agree to let it happen to them again. And to live in this world is to be born over and over and over again. Every time a new thing happens to your heart, each time more frightening and more thrilling. I had that one highlighted too. I love it. Like just <laughs> the image of like the book being born and how it pulls you into the story. And then at the end where it's like being born every time your heart has something happen to it. Yeah. <sighs> Every person draws a map that shows themselves at the center, but that does not mean that no other countries exist. <laughs> this, this whole series has really good map quotes. It loves yeah. it also loves to talk about a map. Yeah. Oh, here's one of my like changelings getting me in my feelings. <laughs> one ought not to judge him. Changelings are all heart. Their hearts are so big that there is no room for anything else. They wear their hearts on the outside, like you and I wear our skin. And so all the bravery and headstrong feeling and sweetness and fierceness and wildness and terror and love has nothing to stand between it and the world, which is why they can hardly bear the touch of the world. Imagine you have fallen and cut yourself rather deeply, and some awful fellow put his fingers right into the wound every morning with your toast and tea. That is what it is like to be a changeling. Everything touches you in your deepest part, whether you asked it to or not. Where human children have years and years in which to grow their hearts and learn to live with them while staying safe from all the troubles a heart hauls with it, a changeling starts out raw and red and full of longing. Thomas Rood had a naked heart even when the rest of him was bundled up in hats and mittens in the depths of winter, and it was this naked heart that hurled itself at everything, at lamps and toys and flagstones and draperies. Thomas could not help it. 
Yeah. Oh. Opposite of our heartless uh, September. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the reasons that like that gets to me so much and t- just um, Hawthorne slash Thomas in general is like, I, I am like somebody who like a, for a long time when I was younger, I felt really self-conscious about being like sensitive, you know, mm-hmm. and like people making fun of me for that or like judging me for it. And so like the fact that this is like one of the things that makes Hawthorne like strong and like who he is and that like it's because he just he just like loves so much. I don't know. Just like healing my inner child, Catherine and Valenti, like no big deal. <laughs> yeah. All right. My my last one here. Um everybody's strange everywhere. Most of the trick of being a social animal is pretending you're not. But who do you fool? Nobody worth talking to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is just a funny one for anybody who has ever spoken English or tried to. English loves to stay out all night dancing with other languages, all decked out in sparkling prepositions and irregular verbs. It is unruly and will not obey. Just when you think you have it in hand, it lets down its hair, along with a hundred nonsensical exceptions. (laughs) (sighs) Another map quote from the chat. The map shows the way to everything, no more, no less, but it cannot choose between Annapurna and Missouri. That is your job. If you want the job, that is. So many good map and travel quotes in the series. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um... Another one about my boy, Thomas. Thomas had not grown up particularly big or strong. He was thin and dark and looked all the time as though he had just received some secret grievous wound. And thus he smiled. And then he looked like everything in the world turning out all right at once. But he didn't smile often. When you have a smile like that in your back pocket, you learn to use it like a little knife. At just the right moments when it can do sudden mortal work. It's funny, they're always telling me to be a man, take it like a man, act like a man. Like they're afraid if they don't keep reminding me, I'll grow up to be a centaur or a dining room table. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, I think we're getting into my blunderbuss quote. <laughs> my best girl, I love her. Um, I'm Blunderbuss, roared the combat wombat, who had not quite yet learned to keep her new voice down. You begin with B, crowed A through L, who decided at that moment she was quite all right in his book. I do, with gusto! (laughs) (laughs) Everything Blunderbuss does is with gusto. I love it. (laughs) Um, And then... We go from, like, really funny into, like, oh, I, am I almost crying again? Okay. And, like, two pages, because this is the one you were talking about earlier, I think. Yes. Um, oh, September, my best girl, I shall tell you an awful, wonderful, unhappy, joyful secret. It is like that for everyone. One day you wake up and you are grown, and on the inside you are no older than the last time you thought, wouldn't it be lovely to be all grown up right this second? Also, every time the narrator says something like my best girl, I'm like, <laughs> just like... <laughs> Remember, not immediately. Like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like, she is, she is my best girl. <laughs> okay. I think I had just a couple more. <laughs> I, is this the most quotes I've had, maybe? I don't know. There's a lot. I still think book three is the most that I quoted. (laughs) Yeah. Let's see. I think there was... Oh, yeah. Another blunderbuss one. (laughs) So so she, like, dove in and she dives in and bites Thomas on the neck and he squeals. And you said I could, blunderbuss grumbled. You said I could gnash you. If you get mad now, that's like breaking a promise. Besides, in the land of Wom, we bite to show we like a thing and that we don't like a thing and that we think a thing is ridiculous or delicious and that we think it is ours because anything you bite is yours. That's just obvious. We bite when we are angry and hungry and joyful and excited to go to the cinema and frightened of wild dogs and because it is Tuesday but also because it is Sunday and especially when we are delighted but nervous nothing says I am having feelings like a bite and I bite you so you are mine Tom Rude I own you 
wombat rules. I own a troll. <laughs> the best part of all of that that whole sequence is that like he's going on and on and on, and then Thomas goes, oh, "I'm a troll." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All your big feelings, uh, blunderbuss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that was my last one I had marked down. So. Ah, blunderbuss. Yeah, another wonderful entry into this beautiful series. I'm I, I say this every every time, but just to reiterate, I'm so happy you're enjoying these. Yeah. Um, and we can stay friends because if you hated them, I don't know that we can. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I understand. Like, <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> we all have books like that, and honestly, I think people who say they don't are lying. But that's just me. Like, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I'm loving these so much, like, especially like this one and the second one. It's like I said at the beginning, there's like so many things where I'm like, this is like specifically like a key to my heart and soul, <laughs> like shortcut to just get me like super emotional. So yeah, I've been loving these. I am like so ready for book five and scared and ready to cry. Um I feel like if the last one does actually make me cry, like I have to take a picture <laughs> to like to like promote our live show discussion. Is like, we'll see. I don't know. Um, I can't remember if I cried. I do. I do think I, I like love this ending to the series. I think it is like just a really magnificent series ender. Uh, which is probably no surprise considering I love the whole series, but also what we know of Kat Valenti thus far, like stringing things together mm. and bringing forward plot lines and the consistency of just sort of like the theme and the message or whatnot. Um, you know, you know, and she can nail an ending, our girl. Yes. Uh, so. <laughs> Ready. Not yeah, to I you know overhype it here no no I, <laughs> I'm ready and like I was just thinking about how like what what it means to have like an author that like I trust you know and I I think she's a great example of one because even though there are things that I like hope will happen in the ending or like I don't want to happen it's like I still feel like as a whole I'm like she's gonna do what's right for the story and for the characters and she won't do something just to shock people and it's and I just I can tell from the way that she writes like everything like we were talking about with like um September and Hawthorne's like human families and like all of those things that like it's going to feel right mm -hmm. and I'm I'm very excited <laughs> yeah me too this is a um I was I don't know why I was just I okay here's why I was thinking about it I was just thinking about how much I love the series and how um, I don't know, like how this is a series that I like revisit because I love it, but also like I don't it, it, this all of the emotional ties there and whatnot, and like wanting to spend more time in this world, but like how well it's plotted and completed as a series. So this got me thinking about like well an adaptation this is like something i don't know that you could ever adapt like, yeah. like ever ever because it's so wild it's yeah. so many different locations it would have to be like all cgi basically like i don't right. i don't know i would even want this adapted um it would have to be like Tim Burton. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Like a graphic novel sort of thing, but yeah. yeah. Or even like, um, you know, in some movies where they have like a storytelling scene and it's like, I always love when they do this. Like then the animation is like, well, it's animated first off, even though the rest of the movie is usually like live action. And it's like, mm like paper cutouts almost mm -hmm. or like I, I like not cut out specifically but that kind of style yeah. it's like I can picture the fairyland scenes happening there yeah. and then like in that kind of thing and then like the other parts being live action maybe I don't know like I think that'd be hard to do in a way that feels cohesive mm -hmm. but I would love to see it I would yeah. also play a fairyland video game yes I will I will be September Yes. <laughs> I'll be Blunderbuss. Like, <laughs> my, my special ability is just biting everything. Like, it's just like running around. And, like, <laughs> uh, amazing. Cat, yeah. 
have your people call my people we've got plenty of ideas yeah <laughs> you're like i'll try to work you <laughs> in like <laughs> awesome um we can we can definitely talk about this offline um but we i messed up our schedule here it took us a little longer to get to this live show um so any ideas for like our final book if that would be like an april thing or thinking april um i let me see because like they're pretty short and yeah. i'm like raring to go to like yeah. finish because i'm all excited so i would i could maybe see like very end of March, very beginning yes. of April. Yeah, that's um, what I'm thinking too. Maybe around there. And then when we do our kind of like wrap up and discussion and all of that, that we can schedule whenever because um it's not gonna be like a book that we have to read for it. So yes. I would guess like around March thirty first, but all right. I'll have to check. So I think we can do it. Um, let, we can schedule a date, but just for like generally for people reading along, they know that like if they want to yeah. keep up with us, that like this will be a we. It is March tenth, March tenth, but this is a March book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we basically have you'll have at least three weeks. Yes. Um, we can squeeze it into your reading. It is a short yes. book, so. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. And thank you for ev uh, to everybody who joined us um, during this live show and for all of your thoughtful comments. I'm so happy you guys are also enjoying it. Seem to be in the chat and everybody who's reading along for the first time. Um, yeah, this has been so great so far. I'm so excited to finish off the series. Yes. And we will let you guys know about time and date uh, for the final live show um, in terms of reading. And then we'll have one last one to just sort of wrap up the project. But yeah. Thanks for joining us tonight and we will see you then. Bye.